Good afternoon. Well, you guys sound tired. <laughs> oh, I hope so. God, I hope so. Uh, can everyone hear me? Too loud? Good enough? Okay. Uh, I'm Aisha Ray, as uh, Susan uh, introduced us, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I want to uh, welcome all of you to this plenary, which is focused on a critical topic in early childhood systems building. Tables of power, whose voices are represented at those tables, and how we must build leadership that represents the diverse complexity of the nation and of our field. Why are all the white people sitting at the policy tables? And how do we develop a racially and ethnically diverse leadership to really serve all the children, families, and communities? This panel brings together experts who will help us understand the benefits, the opportunities, and the challenges before us if we as a field intentionally build leadership across early childhood systems that really reflect that complexity that we see amongst children and that we see in our own workforce. The tables we will refer to today include a range of settings in which programs, policies, and initiatives are created, evaluated, and managed. These tables are the places where decisions related to staff and hiring, funding and resource allocation, training, evaluation and quality improvement, program innovation, and other central and vital issues are discussed and decided upon. There are many reasons, certainly moral reasons, social reasons, um, even economic reasons for developing leadership of color. Obviously, one is the growing diversity of children birth to age five who have been for the last decade leading the profound demographic shift occurring in the United States. But this is just not an issue of demographic change. It is also an issue of empirical evidence a growing body of social science research is finding that diversity materially benefits organizations, communities, and nations. Diversity of race, gender, ethnicity, and so forth appears to increase innovation, creativity, and decision-making all critical to the development of the very best policies for children, families, and our workforce. In addition, diversity appears to influence deeper complex thinking and information processing of all of us who are lucky enough to benefit from being at tables where diversity exists. Tables comprised of diverse groups are more likely than homogeneous groups to engage in in innovative decision-making, to make better decisions, and to respond more effectively to unanticipated challenges. The mechanisms appear to be that when diverse people are at a table, they benefit from listening to and learning from the perspectives of others, and those perspectives expand their own thinking, their own creativity, and their own openness to develop new and innovative ways to respond to problems. We all benefit from mini meaningful inclusion, but most importantly, children, families, and our workforce will benefit if we build a deeply inclusive leadership. The experts you will hear from today represent various aspects of that diversity, as I think Susan alluded to. They have depth of experience, they have expertise, and they represent, to some extent, the very complexity of racial and ethnic uh, diversity we hope to see in the leadership for our field. They also have acted as mentors and champions for thoughtful and creative people of color in the field. 
and have heard their wishes and dreams for advancement to positions of power and influence in order to make their own unique contribution to improving the lives of children. They have described feeling there is a glass ceiling that limits their access to positions of influence and have often reported not being able to navigate past that glass ceiling. How do we change that? How do we begin to make the tables more representative of the workforce that is nearly made up of 50% women of color? And how do we interrogate and dismantle the hidden and explicit ways in which structural racism, white supremacy, and inequities influence and shape our own field? This panel believes we need to confront our own practice and work to improve it together. We cannot hope others, people like teachers, directors, or families and communities, will be able to do this hard work if we're not able to do it ourselves. Today, each panel member will talk about a key issue for about five minutes, and then other panel members will respond to that speaker's remarks. And we'll do this for four rounds of questions. The questions are, why is this issue important now? Why do we need to pay attention to it? And Leah Austin is going to talk about that, uh, respond to that first. Uh, Bibi Otero is going to talk about the value of diversity in early, child and sy early childhood systems development, policy development, and practice improvement, and she'll do that for five minutes, and then we'll have the panel respond. And then Seema Ray James will talk about the consequences of limited representation of people of color in early childhood systems building, building and policy development. At the end, all of the panelists will respond to the question, what do we do going forward? What are the, their recommendations to you as early childhood leaders of what you should do? And we are also going to invite you to answer that question too. So we have two microphones set up, and when we get to that portion of the mm -hmm. program, I'm going to ask you to those of you who have questions, and we hope many of you will, even though we have 1,250 people in here, that we'll have a nice, intimate, closed <laughs> conversation <laughs> together about this critical issue. We also want to remind you that if you want to have a deeper conversation with the panelists, there's an opportunity on Wednesday morning at 10.30 to 12. It's one of the many plenaries is on this very topic, and that's in Harbor Island, too, if you can find it. If anyone can find anything in this hotel, I really <laughs> want to really commend you. You are truly a leader if, in fact, you can do that. Um, so this is an opportunity for all of us in our work to focus on what is, in our opinion at least, an absolutely essential issue for us to resolve in the field. Uh, we're not alone. Lots of other professions are also grappling with this, and a lot of other organizations are grappling with it. So we can have d conversations across with other disciplines and organizations, but we do need to begin to have a consistent conversation about this and try to see if we can resolve it, and in fact create the workforce we really hope to see. Okay, let me advance this with our key question. And then I'm going to ask Leah to begin. Okay. Do you want me to take the clicker? Okay. <laughs> I think you keep that. <laughs> Thanks, Aisha. Um, hi. Happy to be here with all of you. So I guess the first kind of set of questions here on kind of why this time or why now. Um, my first response to that is, well, why not now? Um, you know, Aisha and I have had conversations around this topic for several years now, and you know, we find that despite having entered this work, you know, a generation apart, we have similar experiences, similar challenges, um, navigating leadership, developing other leaders, and the you know the landscape of who's working in the field has changed some, 
our policy tables and decision-making tables haven't been altered as much as really we think they should be. Um, and so I think we really would like for that to not be the case, um, you know, in another generation from now. Um, I don't want to moderate a panel on this topic, right? Um, so that's kind of why now, um, uh, as opposed to, to some other time or, la or later. Um, and we really have to put this question of who leads and why that matters, because it's about whose voices are heard, but also whose voices are silenced, um, as Susan raised and Aisha did as well. And so we have to confront that. We have to put it out there. We have to grapple with it, talk about it, figure out how we make change. And, you know, Aisha, I think as you said, you know, we're not the only people dealing with this. This is not unique to early care and education. We see this in every industry. I mean, you can look to, you know, Hollywood and you see this. You know, people, I think, seem to understand the hashtag Oscar so white movement, that you could have, you know, African-American woman be the head of the Motion Picture Association and have a scattering of um, directors and producers who are people of color, but that doesn't solve the problem. You can still have a diversity problem. So just kind of, you know, being able to point to a few doesn't take care of um, challenges that may exist. You know, Silicon Valley is another kind of classic example. Um, but there are efforts underway that I think, um, you know, across, again, occupations where there's voice um, uh, being, being given and people are really trying to empower themselves and talk about these issues of uh, diversity and race and bias and how that feeds into our narratives and stories and, and who gets heard. Um, and perhaps it's, you know, hardest to look within um, and to think about, you know, how do we see that in our own field? We can perhaps see it more easily um, elsewhere. But, you know, how do we look inward and kind of recognize these challenges that um, we're experiencing as well? And I thought it was really interesting, kind of leading up to this session, the many different kind of comments I heard about um, this topic and the title, and so lots of interest and excitement. But there were also some comments that I think were really apprehensive, like, oh, okay, well, that's gonna be interesting, or good luck with that. Um, <laughs> And you know, a few comments that I, in my interpretation of what I heard, was also that um, you know some people also see this as a problem, or you know it's kind of like, well, there's the four of you sitting up there um, in leadership positions, um, and there are people in other organizations here and there. Uh, so kind of what's what's the challenge? So I think being able to kind of look uh, a little more closely and a little more deeply is really critical, um, though perhaps challenging. How do I advance this? That one? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I think this gets us to uh, why address this issue of leadership specifically. So, you know, we do know, Aisha said this, I don't have to go over it again, but our child population is incredibly diverse and continuing to be more diverse. The teaching workforce in our field, both in home and center-based, are um, you know, between 40 and 50% women of color, depending on kind of what different setting you're looking in. And that often gets held up as a strength of our field and something we celebrate, this diversity, as it should be. But that conversation often doesn't go the next step to talk about, well, in our diverse workforce, like, is that sufficient? Um, should it more, our workforce more closely match the child and family population? Um, we often aren't talking about the issues of stratification, that exists within this diversity, and rarely are we talking about the diversity of the leadership <laughs> ranks of the field. And we have very, very little data about um, who's making policy decisions, who's weighing in, kind of whose perspective and uh, voices are, again, kind of being, being heard. And so as a field, like we have grown so much. I mean, this conference in itself is an example of that. You know, over the last, decade or two, that there are scores more people working in a range of roles that have influence on developing policy, implementing policy, that are making decisions about, um, you know, who gets resources, how do we set our um, QRIS indicators, what are the values that go into that? Um, and that's kind of reflected by, you know, people filling roles like those of us in the room who's shaping research agendas. 
And, but we know really very little other than we can maybe observe in our communities or our organizations, um, but we don't have that data to kind of provoke a response. And so that lack of data about who's leading and whose voices are, are at the table um, can kind of let the status quo ride so that we don't necessarily have to confront and challenge these issues. Um, and so again, I think you know, understanding whose voices are privileged uh, is really critical because who's, who has kind of voice and power um, and, and kind of authority, and I'm out of time, but I'm gonna take one more minute if I can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, shapes how we think about leadership. So our leadership norms are shaped by the people in leadership positions. And um, those norms then shape what we think about who leads and how you have access to leadership. And you know, we, we tend to have in our field, as you know, many fields and occupations, and from my own research and observations have seen this, that leadership is, is kind of assumed to be about you know, your ability, your skills, um, and sort of you know, who, who deserves um, or who earned you know, uh, the, the leadership spot. And that really kind of ignores what we know about um, issues of systemic racism and bias and who has access to um, pathways and what positions you hold. And so when we think about um, you know, that 40 some odd percent of people who are doing this work who are women of color, and we can look around at some of our organizations and see people in different roles, like we don't have a people problem around leadership when we kind of hear these barriers about, well, there aren't diverse leaders you know, to reach. Uh, we have a problem about who we think about who can lead and who has access to leadership. Um, and so I think it's really critical that we, um, we address that. And so I'll skip this slide, but I think it'll come up later in terms of talking about some of the urgent needs that we need to address and uh, why we need those diverse perspectives. Sumare, BB, do any of you have responses to what you heard Leah raise? Oh, I would say to BB. So I, um, I think it's really critical that, that we pay attention to, I think, the, 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 the question that's raised. And, and hopefully on Wednesday, for those of you who come to the session, we can dig deeper in it, is to really define this issue of privilege and define this issue of, um, of why tables of power look the way they do. Um, and that um, we, we, help under, we help ourselves understand what are, um, what are some of the things we take for granted in our lives and assume that um, we, we have the, the right to a particular position because um, we've done X, Y, and Z, because we have this particular uh, expertise, because we've had, but what is giving you the privilege to be able to get into those roles, to be able to get into the, uh, into having those expertise that others may not have? Um, and I think until we, we really delve deeply into what those are and what are the conditions um, in, in, our, in our society that uh, favor some over others. Um, until we get to that point of the discussion and, and, and remove it from our, ourselves individually as, well, but I, it's not me. I'm, you know, I'm the good white person. I'm the one that, you know, that's been, uh, that's been considered, that's been, but you have to un we have to understand what is the underlining piece around what, what places people in positions of power um, and positions of authority and at what, ex at, at what uh, risk of who else who is not at those tables and who's not in those positions. So I think you raised that, I think you raised the question and, and I think it's one that, um, you know, there's 1,200 of us so it's hard to have that discussion, but I think it's one that we all have to sort of look in the mirror and think about. Sumare, any thoughts? Um, I would reflect on the importance of discomfort of being around people that push you out of your comfort zone means, um, as Aisha was saying, and is proven by data, means that we have more innovative thinking, means that we're pushed towards ideas that are more creative and more responsive to families and children. And so keeping ourselves around folks that um, give us comfort means that we're not pushing for leadership that's gonna push us out of our comfort zone and push us to higher level system think systems change. Do you have any reaction? Anything else you want to add? Yes. 
Uh, There's more if time. I may. Well, okay. You, you all have I have a minute. Time. Okay. You have more time on this stuff. <laughs> We're all um, being so good. <laughs> We're following our directions. Um, yeah. So I think I, I just. I, I mean, I want to agree with that. Like really being able to um, push ourselves and you know consider why we need different ideas, why we need to to be challenged, and um, you know we have a we have a lot of work to do in this field to achieve a system that's equitable for children, for families, and for the workforce. And I'll get, uh, use this as an opportunity to get to this slide, but this is just a sampling of like some of the very urgent problems we have to deal with in this field. So, you know, we're talking about parents not being able to afford um, childcare services for their children and families. You know, only a fraction of children who are eligible for subsidies receive them, even with the CCDBG increase that's gonna remain you know, a challenge. Early educators who are living in you know, very economically stressful situations, um, and then we see these patterns of a racial wage gap where you have um, you know, African American teachers working in centers earning 78 cents less per hour than their white peers. Like these are problems we have to deal with and we have to push ourselves because the, the kind of responses we have as a field collectively aren't getting to solutions. Um, and so we really need to, we need more. We need more people um, weighing in on this and bringing uh, different perspectives and experiences to bear. Did you want to? Oh, yeah. So we're going to move to the next question. What is the added value of diversity in early childhood systems leadership? And what difference could it make? So this question for me assumes that we believe diversity adds value. Um, and I'm not convinced that that's necessarily um, where we are today. And I feel a real sense of urgency around this conversation because of some, of some of the issues that were raised earlier by Susan, by others, in terms of what's happening in our, in our society. This past weekend, Europeans were told um, that they're losing their culture to immigrants. I just wonder whether that statement would have been made if the immigrants were white. And so I think it's really important for us to feel a real sense of urgency if, those, if that is the type of thinking that is beginning to permeate our society, whether it's here in the US, in Europe, or, or anywhere else. The, the, the diversity of the population in our communities, is that in fact a, um, an added value? So I wanted to step back a little bit and talk um, um, and think about this from the perspective of those who we all represent here, and that's children. Um, we all are here today because we believe um, that we, we believe in our children, we believe that quality early childhood is powerful in terms of, of the development of our children and very, very much necessary. And so the question is what do we want for our children? Who do we want them to be? How will they walk in this world? And more importantly, how will they lead? So beyond the developmental and school readiness and literacy and all the things we know are great about early childhood, who are, what is the character that we want them to develop? What are those, the dignity, fairness, respect, trusting others, and how is that portrayed by what they see day to day and what examples we're giving them? Um, Children understand power very quickly. All of you who've been in the classroom know that. They figure it out very quickly, right? They know who's in power and they know privilege. Uh, they learn the norms of the group very quickly. They figure out who's the leader. They figure out who's the follower. Um, and, and they know who's in power in their classroom, among themselves, and certainly among the adults. So they see who's playing what role whether it's in their center or whether it's in their home or whether it's in their community. And these roles provide cues to them of, of, of where power is very early on in their lives. Who's my teacher? Who's the coach that's observing my teacher? Who's the cook? Who's the director? Who's the driver? 
Who's the cleaning crew? Who are the guests that parade through our classrooms to see what wonderful things we're doing? These cues tell them where the people who look like them, speak like them, speak like their parents, look like their parents, belong in the hierarchy. So what value is there to diversity? It's what our children see every day in the environment they're in. It's what they see as contradictory to what we teach them in the classroom. We have wonderful diversity books in our book corner. <laughs> How confusing this must be for our children. Yes. Which are they going to believe? The books we're reading or the people that are surrounding us? So organizations need to be very intentional about who, who our children see themselves in. Let's not be afraid to hire the coach that has an accent. The education specialist who followed a non-traditional path. When we open those doors, we also set pathways for those who are missing at the policy table. If we don't start in those classrooms, in those coaches, in those environments, so how are you going to get to the policy table? How are we going to have the knowledgeable people at the policy tables making the decisions for our children and for who, what is quality and what is valuable in our, in our classrooms? As Leah stated, diversity of voices as life experiences, world knowledge provides for a broader perspectives which may be very well lead to better policy decisions. I know firsthand from having served in a policy role that when my voice was, in, was, was at the table, there were decisions that were not made or made because as a child of, as an immigrant myself and a child of immigrants, I, I brought a different perspective to that table and I questioned with a different lens than what someone else may have. So you look at these policy tables, you look at the, at the, at the um, you know, the university that hires a Latina for a department chair who then understands that it takes seven years to become proficient in a language and then chooses to offer coursework in Spanish or in Amharic because those teachers will be able to acquire the skills that we're asking them to have in terms of quality without having to wait the seven years for them to learn the language, to, be, to take the English language course mm -hmm. for material they already know. So let me not get started then. <laughs> or the state administrator who is able to drive policy that favors families who lack transportation because he or she went through that themselves, right? And is able to, dis to say, well, if it takes that, why don't we put intake centers on bus routes so that parents have access to them as opposed to taking three buses and, and walking two miles in order to get recertified. It is valuable to have people who have different experiences and perspectives to be making decisions in behalf of the parents and the children that we serve. I always wonder what would have happened if my parents had not ignored the high school counselor who told them that I was not college material. This always chokes me up. My parents were told I was not college material because I, had a, I was a second language learner. And maybe if I went to Puerto Rico. Well, we weren't from Puerto Rico. Or had I allowed the principal of an elementary school when I went to interview for a job who met me at the door and said, we do not have your kind here and we don't want them here. She did not derail my ambitions. So this isn't really a discussion about early childhood. This is a discussion about our collective ability to recognize a system of privilege that has history, that has culture, and that has institutions. 
and our willingness to debunk those institutions and that culture in order to develop a much better society for the children who are going to lead. one point I wanted to echo. I don't feel like I need to say anything now. But <laughs> I, had, I had one point I wanted to echo. So children really do collect data. So they're collecting data on the people that they see in certain positions of power. So when the governor comes by to sign the preschool for all bill, um, as I happened when I was in Illinois, they're collecting data on who the governor is and who's with the governor and what those advocates look like with them. They also collect data on how people respond to their parents and people who look like their parents and how an educator or a center director responds to their parents' accent and the way that they talk because that's what they have inside of them. And so what we tell our children about themselves is just so important. They really see it. They, they collect that data and it tells them about who they are. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so one thing I wanted to add is I, I was thinking as you were talking about this very situation of you know what do people observe in this curriculum that children are getting by seeing this, that that's also being mirrored uh, with the workforce, right? So when we think about who's teaching and working with children directly, um, it's a very similar experience, right? Who's teaching their college courses? It's most likely not people who look like them or who have shared their um, cultural and ethnic and racial backgrounds. Um, if they you know, see meetings happening in the community, who's at those meetings? It's not necessarily the people and most likely not the people who look like them. And you, there's some similar experiences and challenges and behaviors and, and a curriculum that uh, the workforce is also getting about sort of who has power and who has authority and who is sort of getting to, to weigh in and, and the importance of, uh, I think, needing to bust that up for children and for uh, teachers and providers um, who are working with those children. I think if we think about the life course, so to speak, the professional life course of an early childhood educator, this early period and the experience leadership, potential leadership of color has in this society in terms of messages that individuals get very early on, uh, those messages, and they can be internalized, and we talk about this as internalized depression, you can begin to believe you're, you shouldn't be a leader. And that can happen quite early. And you often see, uh, I've spent a lot of my life in higher education and uh, with lots of students at the BA and the graduate level and even the AA level long ago in my career. And uh, students of color often don't think they can be a college professor or really have a role in state policy development. They're not aware, they also haven't often been mentored to understand the sort of system and how you can move through it. This, this is the system of professional leadership. And the, the fact that their views, their, often their uh, aspirations are truncated, I think is so much a part of this issue of the way privilege and disadvantage gets, there's really a pedagogy for this, for individuals and for young kids, young adults, and, and adults as they go through our field. And they often don't see themselves at the tables. Some of them want to be there, but others have already decided I can't do that. I won't be allowed to do that, this glass ceiling issue. So what do we do about the this, this continuum of development and the glass ceiling in terms of supporting young professionals or old professionals who may have internalized these messages, professionals of all ages, so to speak? Well, I mean, I, do you want me to answer that? Are you going uh, you to can her, any, any of us to answer that? Or I don't know if you were setting up her scenario question. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I think that having the conversation and acknowledging sort of wh what's happening in the field is critical. Because if we, if we continue to, you know, kind of gloss over it or point to a couple of people and let that be sufficient, that's, that's problematic. So I think kind of putting it out there on the table mm -hmm. <laughs> is kind of step one. Um, but I also think that we do have to, mentoring is important, but we have to go beyond mentoring because 
there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen before someone's even in a position to be mentored, to be that, that, that people are aware of um, others who are doing this work in the field. And so I think, um, for me, I, I think we have to really think about how we support the workforce from the time they're becoming teachers and early educators working directly with children because there is just a richness of diversity in our work on our direct service workforce. And we have very few pathways for teachers and family child care providers to even think about kind of what avenues there are for education, for professional development and leadership development that there's just, like the, the pathways just don't exist in any organized, systematic way in our field. And so I think we really have to, uh, we have to develop those pipelines and pathways and we have to be very intentional about those going, not just from someone entering in the field in a mid-leadership position already from somewhere else, but how do we build that expectation in? As in other, you know, if you look at K-12, Many people who are leading in K-12 organizations and school districts, the expectation is you are a teacher, but it's because there's a pathway and we have to do a lot of work to make sure we have that pathway and that that pathway is accessible to uh, women of color in particular in the field. Anyone else want to respond or shall we go to the next? All right, so Seema Ray. And so um, I'll speak a few minutes on this topic, on the challenges, what makes this hard, um, we're, we're up here talking about it because we know that this isn't easy stuff and because it's such a, a long-standing issue. Um, but what makes this difficult and what are the possible challenges? And so we'd like four people, so two at each of the mics, um, and, and I uh, hold, will expect you guys to hold yourselves accountable to being four, um, who would also respond to this question. So I'll speak a few minutes, but we'd love to have um, some audience members um, weigh in as well um, so that we have a, a two-way conversation. Um, so my first point here um, just echoes what we've been talking about, which is um, that we have to start to reshape our thinking, um, that leadership is for the, the few and chosen, um, proven few. Um, and so I, I'm pulling our perspective away from ECE for a moment to entertainment. Um, because it's everywhere. We, we all um, either watch TV or see commercials or hear it on the radio. Um, and because Matt Damon very clearly and famously made this point about leadership being in the hands of those with a proven track record. And if you haven't seen this clip, please go on to YouTube um, and watch. For now, I'll read the slide because I, I didn't trust technology. Um, <laughs> So it says, I'm glad Effie flagged this issue of diversity for all of us because filmmaking should throw a broader net and it's high time for change. But you go for the best director, period. This is what we have and this is what we have to choose. It's all we have to choose, apparently. And the only thing I can go by is the work that they've done. So this is not to harp on Matt Damon, but just to, to, to talk about this like cycle of thinking um, and I think it's, it's points that we can all uh, actually relate to. So one, it's, it's a vicious cycle. So he can only trust a director that has a proven track record of success, those who have a record or those who've been given the opportunity to prove themselves. Um, and also, um, while we have more diversity in movies and TV shows, the vast majority of those shows still show white men as natural creators, natural innovators, natural decision makers and leaders. The lack of diversity behind the camera means that women and people of color are still most likely objects, they're sidekicks, they're the girlfriend, um, and they don't have those positions of their being central to a story um, the way more often white men are. And that's because we have the producers and directors driving the content. And so in order to change, in order for us to permeate the system, all levels of the system have to have access to this change in diversity. It can't just be out in front of the camera. So that's what they're learning. Um, that's what they're learning in, the, in that sector. And so it's, it's really that way of thinking that we have to get at um, that gives privilege to those who have the track record, those who have already been given opportunity. 
And so I point to this way of thinking being a cycle because it, it's also long standing. It, it perpetuates itself very, very well. So the National Black Child Development Institute, um, almost 25, well, 25 years ago this year, um, our founder, Evelyn K. Moore, surveyed uh, 25 black leaders. Um, and she found that uh, barriers, a lack of college degrees, and financial resources for higher education prevent a substantial portion of African Americans from advancing from assistant teacher to director um, and beyond in our field. So those first barriers are the historical ones, right? They're um, housing discrimination, loan discrimination, workforce discrimination, wage gaps that have resulted in limited wealth that has also limited access to higher education. But at the same time, those who have advanced, who have the experience and the degrees, um, they're still feeling shut out from leadership. And this is what, again, Evelyn K. Moore found in 1993. And so being the, this perpetual um, circumstance, we did a survey last year um, of um, ECE policy organizations, so leaders in national ECE organizations, and alum from leadership development programs in ECE. Um, and what we found is that the barriers identified by leaders to promoting um, and hiring black professionals are limited promotion opportunities, but also limited opportunities for them to gain training and limited skills. So again, a, a cycle that perpetuates itself, there are little opportunities um, for development, but then you're not promoted because you don't have that development. Um, and also, as we were surveying um, alum from fellowships. So these are people who have gone through programs designed to support um, their leadership. So they are saying, I am going to ensure that the development is in me. Um, and yet they are still saying that they feel shut out from leadership opportunities as well. And so my, my final points, um, one uh, starts with quoting Aisha Ray. <laughs> um, <laughs> we need uh, leadership intentionally uh, developed to address racial and social class inequities that disproportionately affect black children and, and other children of color. So we have to ensure that as we're developing people and investing in people, and investment, people are investing in themselves, that there are opportunities for them to be represented at this table. Leadership development programs that support diversity are not brand new in ECE, yet we're not seeing those programs result in the type of change in the look of our policy tables. So that's something that we, we need to think about. Um, I think that um, looking at the, the true value of leadership. So is it about passing the platon of privilege to a new group of proven leaders or is leadership about opening doors to those who are most likely to change the system? Instead of looking for people who fit in, who make us comfortable, who are good at mimicking the cultural norms of leadership that we expect, we need to look for people who are most likely to broaden our thinking and challenge our, the way our systems are currently operating. So one very quick example before we hear from folks, I don't see folks at the mics, so. <laughs> I'm expecting two people at each mic um, <laughs> within the, the next sentence. A few sentences, <laughs> awesome. Right. awesome. No fights, no fights, no fights. No, no fights. Um, but one quick example um, of how broader thinking can just help us out. So I, I always, um, it's off-putting to me to hear about hard to reach communities. There are no communities like out on an island. There are no communities hiding from us. There are no people who are like, oh, you know what? We actually operate underground in the sewer systems, right? <laughs> like, there are no actual hard to reach communities. If we've decided that white middle class families are easy to reach, and we design our strategies to reach them, then naturally, this, those strategies are going to make the other communities seem hard to reach. And so I just want to make sure we're, we're thinking about that in our, in our definitions. And so again, for those at the mics, um, what is it that makes this issue challenging? And also, what are some consequences that you guys would like to add? Good Can start on this side? 
Oh, let me go back to the question. Thank you. <laughs> Put the question back up there. Well, oh, one of the things that I thought about as we work in our state. I'm the mics are on. I'm from Alabama. Can you identify? Right, thank you. I'm from Alabama, and I work with the Child Care Services Division with the Alabama Department of Human Resources, and we do various things, but QRIS and lots of things. But when we look at, I'm very proud of our state for the initiatives, quality enhancement initiatives that we've invested in with federal money that came down to the state. But what we are also, what you also see is that with me coming from an organizing background, I started as a community organizer. <laughs> yeah, started as a community. So when I come in, I'm thinking of how can we get more people involved? How can we expand what we're doing? How can we expand the vision? If you have people in leadership roles who are working with caregivers, providers, teachers in certain areas, if they are working from their own filter where they haven't experienced trying to bring others in, then we are seeing where people, I don't even know sometimes if it's intentionally, but they shut others out. And it might not even be an intentional shutting out as we talked about, it might just be, I just don't think of other people that way. I'm you used to seeing people that look like me or that are in, in, in roles and people that can speak a certain way, the articulate person, and, and, and I'm an articulate person, but articulation to me at some point gets to be how can someone express what it is they need to say that represents where they are regardless of how they say it. Okay. <laughs> so there's a skill set you bring to the table because of your organizing background exactly. that you don't always see among the leadership I, in the field. Very rarely. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, gentleman over here. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Nathaniel Roberts. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Education for the Leaguers Head Start Program in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> I would like to say that um, it starts with having diversity at the table, but it has to go further. Leaders, diverse leaders, have to understand culture. They must understand culture and the cultural and social dynamics that affect people of color. So it's not just enough being at the table. Once you're at the table, you have to, I feel, educate yourself on the issues that affect people of color. As an African American male in the field of early childhood education, first of all, we all know that there's very few men in this field, especially now, very few men of color in the field. There's only three of us in one minute. It's only three. <laughs> so I feel personally, I feel personally obligated to advocate for young black boys in early childhood education, especially when it comes to <laughs> suspension, yes. expulsion, quotes, challenging behaviors, but not just white people understanding African American boys, but black teachers, black leaders as well because we are products of an educational system that has misinformed us about culture, of every, from ev everyone's culture. We are products of an educational system that has failed. So we have to aggressively and intentionally educate ourselves in order to better understand culture, where children are coming from, where families are coming from, so I'm very, very glad that this topic is being discussed this year, and I feel that it is a topic that needs to be discussed now more than ever, especially with, with, with what is going on um, you know, in DC. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Brandy King, and I'm with the National Center on Early Childhood Development, Teaching, and Learning at Child Care Aware of America. And I just want to first say thank you all for this. And Seymour, you shared so much. I don't know what else could be shared. But one thing, um, a, as a consequence, I think I'll share from personal experience and experience that I've seen is that there is a layer of um, additional scrutiny that happens to people of color, to African American women and men when they are in positions of leadership that I think wasn't necessarily or quite addressed there. That one, it's they're highly scrutinized to get into that position of leadership, but then once they're in that position, the level of scrutiny is even more harsh. And so I think you may have leaders who have come into the field but don't stay, or gotten into that position and don't stay because of that. And I think when they're, so that's why you see those pockets of diversity that really come up. And um, the other piece that I think it really speaks to is what you've already shared around the subtle forms of racism because you have that layer of you, the folks will look at you and say, oh, there's a less layer of quality there. And so where you mentioned that some people can get into higher positions even though they're not ready, right? They're, they're taking that stretch position. Once those who are ready and are of color get there, it makes it much more challenging to stay there. So I think this conversation is critically important, but also I wanted to highlight that because I think that's something that traditionally will continue to happen unless we really face that barrier. Thank you. It's a very strong point about the, the scrutiny. So I'm going to um, ensure we have everybody gets one minute um, for these last three, um, just given our, our timekeeper is, is very um, on point. And so let's ensure, and um, if we can, cannot clap so long too, but thank you for your applause. <laughs> I'll make sure I'm short then. Uh, I'm Tyrone Scott from First Up in the Philadelphia area. Uh, one of the unintended consequences I see sometimes of um, an underrepresentation of people of color in the policy making uh, uh, world is that sometimes the community upon which they're making policy becomes very mistrusting because there is no one uh, mm -hmm. from that community who, who's involved in the policy making. Mm -hmm. So even with very well intentioned uh, policy makers, even with people who are thinking of the best interests of our children, sometimes the community is scared and will push back. Um, I do a lot of work with people and I hear, well, they're trying to make our kids not ready for school. They're trying to make our kids dumb because there's a conspiracy of some sort. Mm -hmm. And realistically, because of historical racism, um, I understand people's thoughts there. And I think that uh, the under-representation uh, continues to allow people to feel that way as opposed to actually understanding what's trying to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alan Gutman. I'm at the Center for Technology and Education in Maryland at the Johns Hopkins University School of Education. And I'm going to ask that there's no applause after my comment. And I mean, no, and I mean that. Um, you know, we're right now, if you want to know the consequence of not having diversity in power, in positions of power, we're living in Auschwitz right now where there are women being raped. In other countries, they're coming to our borders to be protected. There are children being exposed to violence that are coming with their parents to the borders and being separated violently from their parents. And I, you get the message and, and the absence of the voice of diversity is, I, I, I'm wondering what's Blanca Enriquez thinking right now? What's Yve, Yvette Sanchez thinking right now? Helen Taylor is rolling over in her grave right now, and Mr. Rogers is rolling over in his grave too. We are failing, and we're failing because there is no diversity at the highest levels of power right now, and, and it's, it's, it's really hurting the people that we serve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Last comment? Well, wow. Um, <laughs> Um, I was going to share, I'm Elisa Shepard, I'm with Corporate Child Care, um, I work in government relations and so I do get the opportunity to sit at many tables helping guide policy and one of the possible consequences of limited representation is the overwhelming responsibility to be the one and only at that table. Um, to be an expert in early education, in African American and Hispanic and Latina and Asian 
being the one person that they turn to to ask questions of every community, of every culture, is an overwhelming responsibility that I cannot sit upon, but is expected when you're the only one sitting at the table. And so there is a limited um, opportunity. A, opportunity for us to really do the, what's best for children of all communities when we're not represented. So, uh, <laughs> there have been very powerful statements made, very powerful. So I want to know if the panel has responses to any of the comments that have been made by our colleagues in the audience. So many. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. The, the, there, there is one that um, I think the young woman just spoke kind of began to to describe to what one of the things that. Um, is the great responsibility that, that we carry as, as um, folks from other cultures, other languages, other um, backgrounds, is that when one of us is hired and it does not work out, because it happens, you know, we're not all that great. I mean, we're all good, but you know. <laughs> then the failure is ascribed to a group. Yeah. It's not ascribed to the individual. Um, I don't necessarily think that happens for Anglos. I think it happens much more for us. Ah, oh, that was my Spanish, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, we hired, you know, that Latina teacher or that African American um, um, administrator didn't work out, and somehow that then sheds a light on all of us. Um, as opposed to, well, that one just screwed up, you know, it didn't work out. And so it, I'm, I'm sorry, I should be more respectful. But, so I think this whole issue of ascribing, of one having, always feeling responsible for your whole representation of your whole group, right? And the other is that when you fail, it ascribes to the whole group. And, and so I think that, that for me is, is, a, is a real challenge and one that, that um, um, I think we've, we've all experienced in one way or another. Yeah. It's that, oh, we took a chance. That's right. And that chance didn't work out, right? There, there are these frames, I think, that, are, that enter the discourse often, at least I hear them in, and have heard them over my career, that people use to explain why there's no diversity or not sufficient diversity, the we couldn't find anyone, we tried really hard, they weren't qualified, et cetera. And uh, when asked, when I ask, push back and say, well, what were the strategies and where did you look and how long did you look for and who did you talk to and what networks did you plug into? There's often this, oh, this just happened to me recently. Oh, I didn't, are there networks? <laughs> where would we go? How would we know that? Would you, would I? <laughs> help them find someone. So I think there is also this, uh, these, these frames are really problematic because they allow people to not take responsibility for actually using this stra the same strategies or learning new strategies for how you go after and find uh, excellent, highly qualified, diverse leaders. And the assumption that you simply run an ad in the, in the paper or your local um, journal, for example, or, or uh, professional journal or website is going to get you what you want is really false thinking and simplistic thinking. Um, but the added burden of what you have to do to actually make this happen is perceived as burdensome by many and not worth really pursuing because there's actually no cost in not doing it. People don't, you, the very fact that you can use that frame we tried or the frame uh, we talked to so-and-so and thought she might be able to help us, whatever, that is all you have to demonstrate, that you made a rather weak effort, not that you made a sincere effort. There is no actual cost for failing to hire people or retain qualified, capable, diverse leadership in this, in our field. 
no one's call, really not called on it. So I think that is an additional challenge for the field because of the lack of accountability. I think with the, the example around Matt Damon, again, I, I just challenge everybody to watch that, that whole clip, not to pick on him, but just because we're just the, that way of thinking says that if, if I don't see folks in my um, narrow point of view or in my network, that they don't exist. That a quality director doesn't exist because um, Matt Damon is going towards the best director that he knows about. Um, and what, um, it was Ava DuVernay who asked him the question, what Ava DuVernay was trying, I think, to push him to, to see is, he, she wouldn't have been on, her ra on his radar but if, if you look at the work that she's done, she also has a proven track record that, again, may not be in his view, but the, the goal is, is to um, broaden our point of view. And I, I love uh, the, the first comment, I think, um, from Alabama about having an organizing background. So that idea that we don't all, I'm not, I'm not gonna represent all um, black people, I'm not gonna represent every community of color, but having the skill set and the curiosity to want to learn and innovate and learn more and more, and it be a dynamic process um, to ensure that diverse thinking is represented from everyone in the table, instead of saying, let's turn to the one person of color at the table to inform us, but saying, you know what, the onus is on me to have the skill set to ensure that I'm engaging with people who are diverse. Um, that should be the onus of everyone at the table. It shouldn't be that we turn to the person of color and say, hey, the onus is on you to know everything about right. people of color. It should be a part for all of us and that the, the challenge we give each other when we're at diverse tables, I think is, is the core of that challenge, that it, it pushes us to be dynamic in our thinking. Do you wanna say something? Yeah, I Go think um, just you know, adding on that, Samire, what's been, I think interesting for me, actually, in the last several months, this has come up around, it's not just, um, you know, it's, it's the burden, right, you get turned to, and as you mentioned, and the woman who's now over here, but was at that mic said, um, but it, it also carries with it this assumption that somehow we all think alike and we all agree, so we only need one of us at the table, right? And. I have had this come up several times where it has been expressed to me that um, I was really surprised that you know you disagreed with, it wasn't Samiri in this case, but I'll use Samiri as the example, that you, you disagreed. And it was, and, it, and I just thought, wow. Like, I maybe shouldn't have been shocked by that, but I was shocked and it happened more than once. And it's like, I don't know that I've ever sat at a table where if there's disagreement amongst you know, the white folks at the table, people are shocked that there's disagreement. It's just, there's disagreement, we ought to work it out, right? But somehow it becomes this like, wow, you know, we're, we're not all on the, have the same, same thought. And so I think that's really critical. It's about expanding that diversity um, for any number of these reasons and that being one of them. So, as we're kind of coming to the end of this session, but just, who has that little, ah, good, entire panel. So what do we do going forward? Lots of ideas have been, uh, and experiences have been described, ideas have been suggested. Uh, you have 1,250 leaders here. What's the message? that they should take away from this? What should they go home and do, work on, think about? How should they change? Or are they all, they are all perfect because they're here. <laughs> we don't have to worry. <laughs> what's the, I what's would, the message? I would, I would go to, uh, I think, Susan, you're the one who put up the, the new ovals, <laughs> the non-oval ovals. Novel. And back to sort of what I said at the, at the beginning of, of um, my presentation, which is, you know, when we talk about systems building, we talk about putting, nesting the child, right, with all of these systems. So why don't we nest the child in terms of the leader that we want that child to be? And model for that child the leadership around him or her that needs to, that, that shows him where he or she is able to get to and then create the pathways in that, in that process. So I think that, um, 
you know, it's, it's sort of, it's great for us to be talking about systems and nesting the child, but in the practice, in the everyday practice of how we, how we um, bring people into a child's world so that that child understands and, uh, and absorbs and, and, and is able to um, acknowledge for him or herself that this world is one in which I can lead. Um, I think that's where we, we would make decisions differently if that's what's at the center versus you know, my friend's daughter just finished school and I want to give them a break. Um, you know, that kind of thing. It really is around kind of looking at the whole system and understanding um, how important it is that we do that for the next set of leaders in, in, in our world. I think um, because uh, everyone here is perfect and, and um, <laughs> has, has all been sold and, and they'll go home and, and take the actions we're talking about, that I would say to have these conversations that this shouldn't be something you heard at a conference one time and a couple years from now you're here it again um, and kind of remember back and haven't had a conversation, but the idea of reshaping thinking that, um, that the onus is on us to engage in practices that will move our system towards more equity and diversity um, means that we have to think about it and talk about it and really engage in innovative conversations like these um, in our daily practice. Um, and so that, that would be my challenge. I'm sure everyone here is, is now a convinced believer in the value of diversity and will go out and, and spread that forth. Good. Uh, I think I would say something very similar. I think um, we all have to take responsibility for uh, change and for uh, raising this issue and talking about this issue and working to innovate on a daily basis that we have to, um, I would kind of challenge everybody as you go home in your home communities and you're thinking about whatever decision you're making, whatever you're trying to influence, you know, begin to, if you're not already, like have an assessment for yourself, right? Who's impacted by what I'm trying to do and who's involved in informing what I'm trying to do and who's not involved, whose voices are here, whose voices aren't here. Mm -hmm. uh, just to even begin to think more about your own environment and what's influencing you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I would say along with that, you know, learn. Like there's so much to learn from within our own field. Um, there have been, you know, any number of uh, programs and initiatives that have been successful. We maybe we'll talk about the Elan um, project on Wednesday. There's another, uh, you could go to tomorrow's session to learn about the Alameda County Emerging Leaders for Racial Equity uh, work that's been going on. There's resources on other occupations and fields where people are working very specifically on leadership and equity work. So we don't have to start from scratch. There are things that um, everybody in here can be uh, learning about and, and trying to figure out how to make that work for them. Yeah, I think it's really important, obviously, for people to make a personal commitment to this and to actually then act on it. It's one thing to make the commitment, it's another thing to actually take action. And I think action is, is almost more important <laughs> than the commitment, even though obviously they're related. So I think there's the personal growth people have to make, learning, um, self-reflection, self-reflection with a partner who helps you think through some of these issues, uh, looking at you know, your own history. Have you mentored people of color? Uh, if so, how did that work out? Have you reached out? Do you have relationships? Do we have relationships with people who are not like ourselves? This is a question for black people in the room and brown people in the room and white people, everybody in the room. You know, we all have um, issues of diversity we need to confront. The biggest one in our field, obviously, is this issue of the dominance of sort of white privilege within the field. But this issue of personal growth around mentoring and leadership is really something that's a responsibility of everyone. So that's one aspect. The other, I think, is this issue of developing the capacity to work interpersonally around uh, relationships with others who are not like ourselves. This point about what the research tends to tell us is so beneficial about 
getting to know and work with people who really are different actually makes us better thinkers. It may not make us better people, <laughs> but we would hope that there is a relationship to being a better thinker and a better person. So I think we need to see the value of, ta of being brave. We were talking about this in the earlier session. I think Nathaniel was talking about bravery. We need to be brave and we need to reach out across those boundaries that we think exist and get to know others who are not like ourselves with the idea that this is actually going to help me. Not, I'm not helping them necessarily. I am helping myself. And that interper building those kinds of interpersonal networks and relationships is absolutely critical. The majority of people in this country, and this is from, again, from research, the majority of white people in this country have no personal relationships with any people of color beyond the work site. And once they leave the work site, they don't take those folks home with them. So there's, and this may be true of other groups as well. You know, Martin Luther King said the most segregated hour in the United States is Sunday morning. Um, so we live in segregated spaces. And this is part of the structure of white supremacy. We live in segregated spaces. We need to break that down. There's no reason we have to continue to live in segregated spaces. And if we want to build this field for the children and the families and communities, we have to break down those barriers of segregation. And that is a critical part of leadership. So I encourage you all to figure out how to do that in your space and do it as best you can. Come back next year and report to us what barriers you busted out and who you are now leading. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a great kickoff of the conversations that we need to be engaging in and the kinds of conversations we will share with each other. So please, you have a break now. It's a great time to meet somebody new and then go to your next session, but carry this conversation with you and think in each session about what we're doing in the field to change the isolation. Thank you.